Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the football grump. With me, as always, is Mike, the Cranky Fan, and this season is out of here. <laughs> you know, Grump, we um, it started in the first quarter of the first game. This has been a slow death by, not by paper cut, but more like Full Metal Jacket getting beaten with the sock with the um, with the soap the in soap it. soap in it, yeah. And to, yesterday we got the guillotine. We we killed this bitch. And um, you know it's Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah, I course. didn't. Oh, I mean, I saw the movie when I was a little kid before. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Um, My and, and as you know, make matters worse. I'm we're recording this on Monday afternoon. And Tottenham is you know down two players and they're just getting their asses whipped in the final minutes. Just insult to injury for the weekend, but that's regardless. Um, no, I mean, I, I've kind of been conditioned with both my football teams le- this year that these are going to be tough years. I knew the Gators would be bad. I knew the Giants. I had much higher expectations, but as soon as we got to that very first game in Dallas, just, you know, whipped our ass and how it happened and with the injuries and then the slow descent into madness with the injuries on top of injuries on top of injuries, you know, losing, um, losing Jones, losing Taylor, losing everybody that I am just kind of brain dead at this point and I am numb. And I just never thought we'd be getting into the, you know, starting all over again. And that's where we are. For the how many times has this been now since the Super Bowl victory, we're starting over again. And well, I guess. All right, l- l- only, hang on, hang on. Let's reassess where we is, are because I think you made a statement that's not really entirely true. But go on. You're st- you have to you have to you have to look for a quarterback you're starting over. But the only saving grace to this is this is not a complete teardown like it had to be two years ago. We already have the the general manager and the head coach in place. Guys, we think are pretty good. I don't want to hear any complaints and criticisms and Shane must go, Dable must go, because this is all way beyond their control of what happened this year. So we're starting with a foundation. We're starting with a core roster of guys that we think can be places for this team, pieces for it. The only problem is, is now, and we, we alluded to this last week too, what does this organization think the timeline is? And the timeline just went way out into the future, and that makes decisions on everybody different going forward. And that's what's frustrating. Okay, so let's take this bit by bit. Mm-hmm. The The Giants lost to the Raiders 30-6. to This game was over immediately. There's a number of things in this game that, that I think we're telling. I mean, for, for starters, let's forget the knee injury to Daniel Jones, which was confirmed as a torn ACL today. Um, forgetting that we were, so we, we did this game. We were in the Manhattan office with John boy. So we were with Bobby and Justin of talking giants. And I gotta be honest, I'm super glad that we did that because this game was absolutely miserable. And the only (laughs) way, you know what, honestly, most of our, you, you and me, most of our podcast time, most of our giants attendance, whether home or away has been miserable games. (laughs) Maybe not most, but a lot. More than half. More than half. It's, it's. It's obviously miserable to watch a miserable game, but it's certainly better to do it with company. I mean, like watching this game alone on my couch, I would have changed the channel. And which I, I know that like I'm sure tons of people listening to this did change the channel. I'm sure that people will be like, absolutely. That I hate changing the channel. I look forward to this game all week, even if we're bad. So for me to say that I would probably have changed the channel means that I have really mentally checked out, and that's a big deal for me. So. The fact that we were all together, the fact that you and I are always together, it's a big deal for me. It means a lot, and it keeps the TV on for me. So, oh. you know what? I had a great time yesterday. I'm not going to bitch and complain about but But all four of us noticed the first thing with Daniel Jones' first three passes. He lost it. And I... You know, accuracy is not something that vanishes. Guys can have bad throws. Guys can get rusty. Everything we heard about Daniel Jones was that he's okay. He's not cleared for contact. He was throwing in practice. So there should be no rustiness. Um, I honestly believe that the C3, C4, C5, whatever whatever disc um, is injured in his neck 
and caused weakness in his non-throwing hand. I fully believe it caused weakness in his throwing hand. I have never seen him throw bombs like he did to Jalen Hyatt with that much of a moonshot mortar arc to them. He has always been, and I've been a defender of him, of, of him potentially being a franchise quarterback somewhere based on his downfield accuracy and arm strength. He's got it. What I saw yesterday was him not having it anymore. And I don't know that that's something that just goes away and comes back like that. Like I, I had two thoughts. I had one was exactly your thought. And the second one is based on the activities of this organization in the last month. I am not sure how prepared he was to play this game. I really And that's fair. And if, if, if we if this was just something where we didn't have everything with the nonsense going on with when there were doctor's appointments for him, uh, Tyrod Taylor stuff, kickers coming in and out, and all this nonsense. If this was an isolated thing, I would be I would be one thousand percent in your camp. But there's something about the shenanigans that have gone on, the secrecy, and the just I don't know what to call it incompetence or whatever that was Daniel Jones. Was he really ready to play? Was he forced for no other reason? Were they babying him so much in practice that they didn't want to have any potential setback during the week and at the price that he wasn't ready to play? Because he clearly was not ready to play from a physical standpoint. I, I will agree with that. I'm not, I'm, and I, I think Ooh. that we're probably going to end up talking at length about the, the preparation this last couple of weeks. Um, but in general, I, I, I think you can make that argument about maybe, you know, miscommunication between him and his receivers. I think you can make that argument about audibles at the line. I think you can make that argument maybe if if the play clock were consistently running really far down or assignments were missed or something like that. But I'm strictly speaking from an arm strength standpoint, and it wasn't those first three throws alone. Like I said, those there were yeah. a handful of throws to Jalen Hyatt downfield, and I, I know that one of them was Tommy DeVito, which got picked. Um, but there were at least two Daniel Jones shots to Jalen Hyatt, and Jalen Hyatt was open, and it's not like Daniel Jones <laughs> missed him. Like, yeah, it, 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 He missed him by putting way too much air under the ball, which is just not something that Jones does when he throws deep. And, I mean, and I, so I, when you take the full collective of Daniel Jones's throws, I fully agree with you that I don't think he was prepared. I think a lot of the team maybe wasn't prepared, but I think that there's something also with the arm. I think it's both. I, I completely agree, and I think if we went back and replayed history again and Tyrod Taylor wasn't hurt, I think Daniel Jones would still be inactive. There's no way. Just I think I you're probably kind of battery, right. I don't know what kind of battery test they're doing, but if one of those tests should be throw a football 60 yards. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> again, Jones has the arm strength that he's still got the ball downfield. But he didn't get downfield in time because he didn't throw a yeah. rope. He threw he threw some kind of – you know what it looked like when Tyrod Taylor tries to throw deep? Yeah, I mean there's a difference between you know a starting – an elite NFL quarterback versus a starting NFL quarterback versus a backup quarterback versus a college quarterback versus a junior college quarterback versus a high school quarterback. They all could probably get the ball 60 yards. The question is, is one going to happen in three seconds versus one going to happen in a second and a half? And those were throws that look like when, you know, Alabama or LSU plays Northern Illinois. That's what you see from their quarterback is what you saw. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Jones is done for the year. He, the Giants are stuck with him next year. We were going over the financials yesterday. I mean, there was always an out quote unquote out built in after year two. I don't know why beat writers today are trying to, you know, harass fans into saying that it's not an out because it's a $22 million dead hit. It's essentially the same dead hit that they took on Kenny Galladay. If the player is shot, the player is shot. It's a dead out. They will take it. Trust me. Let me ask you uh, quick especially, quick. especially if they're going to replace Jones with a rookie quarterback on the rookie pay scale, they will absolutely shred him with that dead number. Are you kidding me? Yeah, one quick question. Let's say for whatever reason because of this, Daniel Jones has to retire. Then what happens? I am not a capologist or a contract lawyer. I am actually. I'm not a contract lawyer. I'm a contract paralegal. Um, okay. <laughs> but but I, as far as sports contracts go, I I think that if he – there is some level of injury guarantee, and it's a high number. 
But I don't know if that goes against the cap. Personally, I don't give a shit how much of Mara's money is spent on Daniel Jones. Oh, I only oh, care oh, about the cap. Oh, I, oh no, I'm, I'm assuming he gets every penny if he has to retire for a medical reason. I mean, there's insurance, there's whatever is in, in enforcing the country. My my question is going to be about that. I think the dead out still counts. I think the dead cap number still counts in the event of retirement. I don't know. I don't quote me on that, but I well, feel. If it, something like that if this is a brett Favre, i'm retiring that's one thing but if a if it's a david wilson i have to retire because of medical injury i'm never cleared to play again well it seems different it does seem different i think that would come down to whether or not he would pass a physical yes yeah of course okay Absolutely. so yeah, yeah i guess if he can't pass a physical but i mean there's there's two things right there's being able to pass a physical and then there's you know you can pass the physical, but if you do continue to play, you could seriously re-injure yourself. You know, you could die or something like that. It's a neck injury, so I'm, I'm not being no facetious. Longer, if or, he no longer can play because of a medical – there's a medical – he's not retiring because, you know, I don't want to risk it again. That's retiring. Well, but, but what I'm asking you is with, with David Wilson, he retired because of spinal stenosis. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. In that event, that is not – not passing a physical, I don't think. I think that just means that it's up to the player if they would like to continue knowing the risks associated with that injury. Or am oh, I wrong? It, I I don't remember. I don't know. Um, well, okay. If it's if it's case A or case B, if it's because he can't pass the physical, I think that there's probably some cap relief in the form of not having to pay the dead cap number. Yeah. Being being the, and, and you know whatever mo- injury settlement is off off the books or whatever, but um. Or maybe it's there's like some kind of slashing of the amount or something like that. Uh, but you know that's the spirit. The spirit of the cap is does not mean you're bound because of that's kind of an act of God. I wonder. You know, I don't know. Um, I'm not, I'm really not 100 percent sure. But but either way, I don't think it matters because I don't think that they're getting rid of Daniel Jones next year, regardless. Um, I don't think they should. No. To be honest. Yeah. I mean, well, let's, remember, let's, the only quarterback that will be on the roster next year is Tommy DeVito at this point. Yeah, that's not – yeah. But, I mean, let's let's think of the scenarios. I mean, let's say we do go the route and we end up with a <laughs> a top three pick, top four pick, or we do an Eli Manning and we trade up to get the guy that we want. I mean, we have Daniel Jones still on the roster. We don't need to force a quarterback to play right away. We are not in that – oh, we just need a quarterback and we're going to the Super Bowl type of thing. And with this offensive line, you know, if we're going to spend a first overall pick, you know, or a first round pick on quarterback, that's a pick we're not going to be using potentially to shore up the offensive line or to get an elite wide receiver or something else that will help this offense. So do you really want your future franchise guy who really can make a difference being thrown to the wolves in week one, two, three, four, five, ten? Or Daniel Jones, you know the offense. You know you're you're gonna get paid this year. Let's do a Kurt Warner into Eli Manning again. So here's the thing. The other way to look at this, first of all, I fully agree with you. But the other way to look at this is look at how fucked the Giants were this year because they had no viable backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. You have one on the books that you're – well, first of all, they, they can't get rid – Daniel Jones' dead hit next year is something like $70 million. It's not happening. It's, it's literally not, not going to happen. Um, but but forget the money. I mean, just like I said, the Giants were screwed this year by not having a viable backup quarterback. You have a guy who was worth at least to one GM, but certainly to others, but at least to one GM was worth a four-year $160 million contract Mm -hmm. or worth $40 million a year or whatever you want to say. He was at least worth a contract extension. Uh, He he was going to command big money on the open market if the Giants didn't do that. Same money, probably not. Big money, definitely. He would have been a commodity on the open market. He'd be a starter somewhere else in this league. Now you've got him as your starter next year, and if you've drafted his replacement, your his replacement is now his backup, and that's you know significant. Yeah. Uh, you you assume that he's going to be, be- you, you, his replacement will be better than him. Now you've got a better than what you had as your backup. Mm-hmm. The only thing that throws a wrench into it is whether or not Daniel Jones will be ready by week one next year, which tells me Tommy DeVito is destined for the practice squad next year. Uh, Matt Barkley or whomever who is replacing going forward the rest of this year is – the hope would be that you re-sign him for next year, right? And you move forward with three quarterbacks next year. 
on the roster. That would be yeah. that would be the way I handle things. You get let's just for the sake of argument, let's say Caleb Williams. For the sake of argument, you say Matt Barkley. You start yeah. next year with Matt Barkley as your quarterback one, Daniel Jones probably on the PUP list, Caleb Williams as your backup quarterback. You oh. hope that Mac Bartley can make it through four weeks or whatever. Daniel Jones gets activated off of the PUP. That's now your starting quarterback with Caleb Williams as your backup going forward. And then you feel it out. You let it go as far as it needs to go. And hopefully the hope is that you are able to replicate what Kansas City did with Alex Smith and Patrick Mahomes. No, I see. I think if we draft, if, if we draft like Caleb Williams and Matt Barkley is the backup, we start the season. Caleb Williams is starting. Whatever, one way or another. Yeah, That's not my, yeah, that, yeah. that wasn't my point. My point is yeah, that you had the insurance policy. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the, but it does it does throw a wrench into things when you have drafted a guy and suddenly he's got to play the first four weeks. Now it's not the worst case scenario because you can hyper focus on those first couple weeks so that he's not in the worst scenario possible. And the, and the league is different than it was 15 years ago. Absolutely. They, 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 I mean, the, the years the, the the league of. Uh, you know, Vinny Testaverde, a Heisman Trophy winner, not playing the first year. The years of Peyton Manning, you know, not starting the first couple. Those are over. I mean, C.J. Stroud is playing right now. Um, you know, uh, everybody, all these starting quarterbacks. Bryce, draft, Bryce Young, Bryce Will Young, Levis is right playing now. over Malik Willis. Yeah, right. They're all starting right now. So it's, it's a different league. And, you know, these quarterbacks, they're they're playing in college earlier. You know, so they're getting more reps even in the college level. But you know, it's it's crazy different. how many guys are true freshmen now. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. like, okay, Trevor Lawrence won the national title as a true freshman. That's understandable. But JJ McCarthy great. played as a true freshman. Mm-hmm. And, and Florida's going to have DJ Lagway next year, a true, true freshman, most likely going to be playing, starting over a fifth year senior. Yeah, most likely. Really, you think over Graham Mertz? I think he will. And there's no hope of Mertz leaving. A hope or whatever. He's not going any. I don't think. He, I think he's just. I think their game's gonna be a real, real battle to start, and I would not be shocked at all if DJ starts, especially okay. if they bring in an offensive coordinator. That will be on the Just uh, Gators podcast, which will be starting soon. <laughs> um, I want to get a little bit more into the preparation for this game. Okay. I, I, I and it, it's more of an overarching thing for preparations. This isn't gonna be too hyper focus on this game, but this game was a could have had game. I mean, this is, we said last night, this is probably the easiest game remaining on their schedule. They had just fired their head coach. Now, granted, he's a bad head coach, and they weren't playing well under him. I mean, like, and by playing well, I don't mean execution. I mean just mentality. They were not fighting like dogs out there, other than Max Crosby. Um, They benched their starting quarterback for a rookie with an awful mustache, second only to Arthur Smith. Um. This was a game that they could have had, and it's coming off of three weeks in a row where I've criticized the preparation going into the game, where it felt like between roster and quarterbacks and whatever, they were banking on Danny coming back earlier than he was ready, even though, I mean, from our perspective, there was no information that would lead you to believe that he was going to be ready soon, other than coaching decisions such as marking him as questionable and things like that and splitting reps even though he's not clear for con- and just just you know all of the signals that were being sent to us and not not that our reception of signals is important but everything that we are able to read of tea leaves was that it's just the cleared for contact as soon as he's cleared for contact he'll be ready to go and it was that hang up that was holding things up but every decision based on that was, you know, you had a guy who was not cleared to get hit in a sport where everybody gets hit on every single play, taking first team reps, and then you had a guy who is more likely to play taking none. And that happened multiple weeks in a row, even when we saw the results of what happens when you do that. I'm not not gonna get mad about this because this season doesn't matter anymore and Tommy DeVito doesn't matter and all of that's true. I, I, I but was- but I am look, I, I like Joe Shane. I like the direction. I like the, the, the group of guys he's assembled. I like the draft classes he's put together with the limitations he's had. I like Brian Dable. I like the staff he's put together. I like the way he coaches in-game most of the time. I'll never love completely the way a coach coaches a game anyway. But I- it is very easy to criticize the way they've prepared the last couple of weeks, right? I think it takes a lot, if not almost all, of the shine off all the good that was done last year. Because... Last year's last year. And when things are good, things are good. It's easy to coach that way. When you have to make tough decisions and you have to 
zag when you're supposed to zig, this is where you become a coach. And here's why I'm frustrated. Whatever happened with, you know, deciding whether Daniel Jones is ready or not, how they're going to handle this one thing. I'll tell you one person they were not prepared for not playing and did nothing about it and looked like they were deer in the headlights. No more Leonard Williams. This looked like a team that lost Leonard Williams in a trade at one o'clock Eastern time and had no backup plan for not having a guy in the middle stopping the run and maybe giving you a bit of a pass rush. That's what that looked like a very, very poor game plan, poor execution to try to stop a team you knew was going to run the majority of the time with a rookie quarterback coming in and a new offensive coordinator who we thought was going to or new coaching scenario where they were going to simplify everything. The fact that it just looked like, where's Leonard? Oh, there's another guy running for eight yards. That was what really frustrated me. I, you know, I feel right now a lot more confident about Joe Shane than I do about this coaching staff. And I'm going to be very honest about that, that these are types of things that, you know, it, 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 it shears the skin off your bones. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know, going for it on for a, a field goal in week one of your very first game is one thing and gets you all excited. And seeing a coach, you know, in a Ranger game and you get all your nads pumped because he's in New York or something. But at the end of the day, maybe we're just, you know, getting water out of a rowboat. We're going to sink anyway. But this was not a way. This was not a way in the last month to be prepared to put your team in the best possible position to win and it's very frustrating and it's now you know i'm now at kind of defcon three which is coaching staff to see how are they going to grow from this how are they going to you know handle similar situations going forward because it on the outside looking in it looks like chaos to me um yeah i'll i'll agree with that i i think it was more than just that though i i didn't think that you know, Giants had zero sacks, and sack numbers aren't everything, but they allowed a rookie quarterback and a rookie head coach, a rookie interim head coach, mm-hmm. um, who was never even head coached at the college level, uh, pick apart a, a complicated and confusing defense. And I, I think that Wink Martindale might have overthought this game a little bit. I think that the preparation wasn't there because it wasn't just running the ball. In fact... So we talked about this, right? Uh, you have a new, you have an interim head coach in that's trying to clear things up for players. He's trying to fix a situation. He's not trying to install anything. He's trying to just clean things up. And whenever you're trying to clean things up, the first thing you do is you simplify everything. That's just always what happens. Whenever there's an interim head coach, the first thing they do is they uncomplicate as much as possible. They get football down to its basics. They get communication down to its basics so that plays can be executed correctly. And what you usually do, and I'm not a coach, so when I say you, I mean what I've seen, it seems like a very simple concept and game plan goes into the next game. And going forward, that is what you you just you shed the bullshit, you start over from the foundation and build your way back up. Now, a lot of times these guys win their first game because they've they've simplified what they were doing, communication gets easier, and it becomes about playing football again instead of overly thinking about everything. And also, there's a shakeup, you feel a little bit different about the game, there's a psycho psychological impact to getting an interim head coach, etc. With that being said, whenever a team is going to simplify things, that's when you can just it's it should be easy to see how exactly they're going to simplify it. Should be simpler for you too to prepare. You have, exactly. You it, it, this is where playing like two steps ahead in chess like kind of comes in here. What is the easiest way in which Vegas with Aiden O'Connell and Josh Jacobs will simplify this game against a very notoriously difficult defense to deal with? They're going to look for hots anytime. They're going to look for common blitz fronts when we actually and, and uh, scenarios down in distance in which we typically blitz, formations in which we typically blitz, etc. And they're going to throw against the hot and they're going to lean on the run because their running back is the star. Obviously, they have Devonte Adams, but if he can't throw to himself, it's not much to ask a, a rookie quarterback to hand off be- to a very good running back, right? Yeah, yeah. So, knowing that, your keys should be to. Make your blitzes more disguisable. Don't be so easy to read. Go different than what your film is. 
and shut down the run. Those should have been the the two objectives of Wink Martindale's defense. Keep the ball in the quarterback's hands as much as possible. Absolutely. And that's why I said feign all the blitzing. Fake it in the first half. Confuse him. Line up in all your normal, you know, 11 guys on the line of scrimmage and have everyone drop into coverage and only rush four or three. That will confuse the shit out of him because then he's going to be looking for his presumed hot and see guys in the way and then start panicking because that's what rookies do is panic. And then you trust your guys like Kayvon and Dexter Lawrence, etc., to get there in three seconds instead of one second when all he has to do is look towards his hot and throw at it. I mean, it's no wonder that a very good defensive front didn't get any pressure. They were throwing at hots all day. Now, I don't want to get too much into the game, but just in terms of preparation, that seemed very obvious. In terms of the running game, I think Leonard Williams was sorely missing. I agree with you there. Sure. I think what it, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, interesting on this note was an Xavier McKinney quote today. Yeah, I really, want, I really want to get into this because it doesn't matter really anymore of, you know, what the talent is. The, the question is going to be, how is this team mentally going to be for the final? You and I can check out the rest of the year. They can't. And let's see what let's see what they're thinking right now. So Xavier McKinney made a statement that captains weren't necessarily being heard. He didn't say who, but he implied coaching staff. And I, I assume maybe front office. I, just everybody oh. above captain. See, I looked at it as players weren't responding to captains. No, 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 no. It was the other way around. Oh, because, okay, because that was my take when I read that today. It's just like, <laughs> Xavier McKinney, are you really a captain? Is you're a voice? Or all the captains' voices really being heard on this team? Are they, are they just barking into the wind and, you know, players are doing their their freelancing and getting ready for their golf in, in January? No, looking at the full quote, he was talking about, the coach, he was saying that people were seeing things on the field and they weren't being responded to when they were voicing their opinion on the sideline. Uh, you know, captains talking to other players, there's no response needed from uh, players, just got to listen. Coaches are the ones who get to make the changes based on that. The interesting thing for me is uh, Andrew Thomas, I think it was, oh, man, I, I, I hate I hate not attributing the work to the right author, but I, I believe it was. Dan Duggan that took that quote and asked Andrew Thomas about it, and he didn't have similar feelings speaking about the offense. Now, Xavier McKinney's on defense, and they got shredded. They were the ones that kind of had no excuse. 30 points to the Raiders is kind of a what the hell happened in this game. Um, They didn't play particularly well. They had zero sacks, like I said. It's not that they were awful, but like they made they made Aiden O'Connell and the Raiders look like a legitimate offense. I'm go, I'm going to go with awful. Yeah, um, I'm sorry that to so me is an awful performance. He kind of walked back the statement a little bit. You know, he did mention that the players are still the ones on the field that need to execute, and he said it more than once in the full quote. Um, I find it interesting because we were just dis- first of all, I find it interesting because there's not that many captains. Like, there's a team with too many captains. Leonard Williams is one of them. He's traded. Graham Gano is another one. He's hurt. Daniel Jones is another one. He's hurt. Half the captains are hurt or gone. Yeah. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I find it interesting because we were talking yesterday as Xavier McKinney might not even be back next year. I mean, there is a possibility that he's brought back because he's not going to command the money that he thinks he will on the open market. And he's clearly a serviceable player. That's a, a bona fide starter in this league. We know that much. Um, but he is, I, I he, said, he's had a rough year followed by a year in which he broke his fingers. Like, and he hasn't had some good media quotes either. This is now the second time that he has said something that I was like, ah, you're a captain. Don't say that. Don't let's, say that. Let's put it this way. I think I said it on one of our shows maybe a week or two ago. We were talking about him. And I was like, I don't think he's coming back. I think he's going to become a Daniel Jones casualty of time frames. That if we are starting over with a new quarterback, I don't think I want to spend money on him next year and the year after when we're kind of waiting for a quarterback to put us in position for the window. So I think I think his fate was sealed the moment Daniel Jones went down and was out, that he won't be back. I don't think so. I think his fate was sealed when he didn't play well. I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, there's just I, like maybe one game in which you could say he played okay. Uh, yeah, or like I mean, two games. I mean, like l- l- let me say this way. He, he, he's a captain. Daniel Jones got hurt. But if he was playing lights out, they're not going to not pay a safety just because 
they might draft a quarter. The, the, the quarterback's going to be on the rookie pay scale for four years anyway. It's but really they, just the DJ contract that would complicate him. No, 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 no. I'm talking about, you know, do we want to pay money to have, you know, all of our stars aligned to make the run? Like the expectation before, I think at the beginning of the season was probably in 2025, this team really will be competing for greatness. And I think that window's moved back now. Well, hang on. How long is that window beyond 2025? No, well, a handful of years. So 2025 to 2028 is a fair window based on what How, you thought? So before before he got hurt? Yeah. Before, before, before we had Danielson's out of the equation? Yeah. I would say the window is probably four to five years. If you have a quarterback who's in the – a quarterback you think is your franchise guy in the prime of your career and you're building the roster up for a window, I think the window is like four to five years. So you think that that window suddenly closes if they draft Caleb Williams next year? They're yes. not go, They're not going to compete by 2030 with Caleb Williams? Joe Burrow went in two years. I don't know. I will – I mean – I'm not saying that – all, all I'm saying – I don't think – an exception to a rule. I mean most – I mean, it, it, gets, it definitely gets pushed back. Definitely gets it pushed. gets pushed back. We have I agree. a lot of work to do on offensive line. We have a lot. We have a lot of work. One hundred percent. No, 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 no. I, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not discounting any of what you're saying, but mm-hmm. I am going to discount that I think that had anything to do with Xavier McKinney. Because if if you think that that window with Daniel Jones is 2025, 2020, and and you immediately have to draft a guy, he's still going to fall in that window. Whatever contract they were going to give him based on Daniel Jones being healthy and the expectations with that, they they still fall in that window. I mean, they would still be competing in 2028. I can't imagine they wouldn't give him a three-year deal if they really wanted to keep him anyway. But, so, but with so much you have to build on this roster, I mean, how much is he going to command on a three-year deal, let's say? Well, if they wanted to keep him? Yeah. Per year? Rough estimate. I mean, yeah, he, yeah, but, 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 he's I not mean, getting $4 million a year. He's going to get he's gonna get paid. Yeah. I, no, no, no. I agree with you. But I'm but saying I on, on a— it's better served, you know— building this roster up better served is one thing but i mean i don't know i don't know i don't know if i agree with that i have no idea what else is out there you know what i mean like to say it's better i mean you're going to spend the 10 million a year somewhere uh if the best option is the safety then they would have done that i honestly think because so that that's actually interesting um I don't want to go too far down this path because this is going to be a topic for us for the entire <laughs> offseason. But I, but I am <laughs> but I am curious, right? Let's just yeah. say – let's name the five most important – if they want to compete soon, and by soon is within the window, what are the five most important positions that need to be addressed? My, I'm going to posit something, and you tell me if you agree or disagree with all five, right? Yeah. They're yeah. going to need a quarterback, number one. Absolutely, number one. They're going to need an interior offensive lineman that's a starter, Right. Um, yeah, I, keep going. Let me see what your other ones are and okay. I'll rank them more. Number one wide receiver. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're going to need another safety, whether it's with Xavier McKinney or with Jason Pinnock. They're going to need another safety. Like the mm-hmm. two of them together is not good enough for me. Yep. Yep. Um, and then I guess the fifth one. Edge. Or somewhere along the defensive line, yep. some other uh, motherfucker. That, that, I was afraid you weren't going to say that one because that to me seems like a going to be a glaring hole that needs. No, no, to be no. Addressed. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's edge, and then I think like if you want to put a sixth one in there as a almost like a a, a a tier below backup tackle, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so if those are the if those are the ones, let's just mm-hmm. say of those five positions, you can only pay a veteran for two of those positions. What would you, which ones would you send the money to? If I was trying to compete right now, my no, 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 with it within oh. that with that that window, but you're going to use two of those are going to be free agency signings. The other three are going to be draft picks. Where would you like to? Forgetting names, just just thinking strictly about typical contracts, what you can get for what money, etc. So if I had like a salary cap for that amount of money and say you can spend it on this, uh, I probably. Probably guys on both lines. So you go, you go with the interior offensive lineman, and you'd go with either the DT or DE. Yeah, right? yeah, and uh, the, I, I don't know if I want to spend big money on a quarterback right now. No, no I, way. I, well, I, I mean, it's a wa- I think it's it, a waste of money, and I think, uh, you know, a wide receiver. I feel like I could get that. 
I, 100%, yeah. yeah. I, I fully agree. Never pay a number one wide receiver. I mean, if you're going to pay the number one wide receiver, do what the Bills did and trade for him and then deal with the contract however you need to. Whatever. I agree. But, I agree. But you, you get a known quantity, and, and getting him in a trade, I think, is always better than buying them in free agency. Um, but, it's just hard it's just but, I mean, hard it, to find doesn't offensive it, and defensive linemen. It's it feels hard. like if not every year, every other year, there is a number one wide receiver in the draft. It definitely feels that way. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's right. I don't feel like looking it up, and you can call me wrong, and that's fine. I also fine. feel like you can find at number 27, you can find a, a wide receiver. It can be just as valuable if you're the number one. It's hard to find really good linemen on either side of the ball. They, 100% they, agree. They never show up on the, on the on the free agent market. It's impossible to trade well, for them. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? We, we made the argument that if you want to fix left tackle right now, you have to pay a guy like Nate Solder because he's the only one in the market, and based mm-hmm. on his position, that's we the money fine, he commits. And we were fine with that. We both l- were. L- I, I was fine with it because something needed to be done. Yeah. Now, I neither one of us anticipated Nate Solder dropping off as hard as he did. But the, the fact remains is that you can't have a dire need at left tackle for years and years and years because it becomes a, we need to fix this right now. No draft picks, no nothing. We need somebody there that can play the position right now. You end up spending way more than you have and you end up getting way less than you need every single time. So mm-hmm. I'm with you. I, I think with an interior offensive lineman, you're probably getting somebody that's going to cost a little bit north of Mark Lewinsky's salary, which is certainly doable. The DT market is really, really tough. I think you, even if it's edge, if you're getting a guy that's going to be opposite Kayvon Thibodeau to be like the number two edge guy, you could probably get by with like something along the lines of like a Leonard Floyd contract or something that's like a three-year deal. You know what I mean? Like, would you say that Leonard Floyd is like a decent player comp for a Fine. cross from Kayvon Thibodeau? Yeah, now, if you yeah. want someone to let Kayvon be the number two, then you're really spending money. If you need like <laughs> a Von Miller gonna, level. Now you're in the high rent district, yeah. I mean, you yeah. are because now we're talking about Von Miller levels of edge talent. Not that Kayvon's super amazing, but Kayvon is already that tier Kayvon's two. Kayvon's a one. Be, yeah, yeah. He's not an elite one, but he's a one for right. sure. Yeah, he's not J.J. Watt. Or TJ Watt, but he's, you know, he's somebody. Yeah. He's Bud agreed. Dupree or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I agree with you. I think I might pay the safety instead of the edge. I think that you could probably get a disruptor on the defensive line in the first or second round that will do good enough. Um, safety, I think, is hard to draft. My, 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 it's just my point. I, I do think that with the the needs that they have though they only have like five serious needs to address over the next let's say 2 years right um i i i think that Xavier McKinney could have worked into that but i think he walked i think this whole year has been an exercise in walking himself out of new york right i agree i agree and not agree. not intentionally um i your, think he, your actions have consequences and he is he is dancing to his own drum path you know, drum beat, not the right off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not sure if the he's, cliff he's is following Justin off the uh, off the. Oh, yeah. floor right <laughs> um, Love you, Justin. Uh, so, did you find what he said interesting? Like, what what was your takeaway? Uh, I guess you had a totally incorrect interpretation of what he was trying to say. But n- knowing knowing what he said is that the coaches aren't listening. He's pretty much at this point. I would say I know it falls under the Brian Dable purview, but. That's a Wink Martindale complaint, isn't it? I don't like to hear what players say right after emotional games like that because they just, you know, whatever, you know, I give this team credit up until this point for not quitting when this team very easily could have quit. Daniel Jones gets hurt. They lose the first game 40 to nothing. All of these things have happened, and this team was a one yard from winning in Buffalo. This is a team that competed with Miami. This is the team that should have beat the Jets. I mean, we're talking about a team that is was still playing. And then, okay, Daniel Jones is back. Andrew Thomas is back. John Michael Smith is back. Everybody is just about back. Uh-oh, that's not Daniel Jones throwing. That's Cranky Fan throwing. And then... Uh Uh-oh. He kind of crumpled to the ground. All right, he got... uh Uh-oh. He's really hurt. And I've seen that before. 
And, you know, they just went in and just took his heart and just went, you know, <clears throat> ripped this team out. So this is this team is emotional right now. They're upset. They probably said things that, you know, they're just frustrated. So I take all of that stuff with a bit of grain of salt. Having said that, there probably is, you know, stuff creeping up in the last week that is causing these little things to happen. I mean, I'm sure there's got to be, you know, an offense versus defense thing. There has to probably be a coaches versus players thing. It's just going to start bubbling up, but I don't make too much of it. I think you you have this conversation on 24 hours later. I mean, that's why we do this podcast. We don't say stupid things on Sunday evening. We wait till Monday when we have a little bit of a clearer head. And I think he was doing his podcast on Sunday night a little bit. That was that was a great answer. I like that. Thank you. Um, clip, clip that. Is they I, say I, I, I might. Things. Yeah, that was that was funny. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I agree. So here's the thing, right? Evan Neal said something stupid earlier this year, and I ripped him apart for it. Evan Neal's not a captain. David McKinney's a captain. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's that's so here. That that's kind of where I land on that. I agree with you. They're emotional. He's the guy who was drafted in the second round. He's the guy who's you know. There are responsibilities that come with captain. You don't just get to be one. Um, uh, I I. I, Why would Evan Neal be the captain on the offensive line when there's Andrew Thomas there? Well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah. I, I gave I gave no leeway to Evan Neal, and he's not a captain. I can't give any leeway to Xavier McKinney at all. Um, but I, I agree with you. I, but but this also falls under the same thing I said about Evan Neal. Is like, why are you asking him stupid questions? Why are you asking him how he feels after he clearly played one of the worst games a football player can play? Like, what do you think he's going to say? And you know. Media people ask those questions to get sound bites. I mean, they ask, okay. If you ask a media person, they ask it to get answers. And Xavier McKinney gave an answer that kind of opened the door for more answers. Xavier McKinney's answer is actually what media people say they're looking for. The result is media people don't care if they say what McKinney said, where it opens the door for more questions, or what Neil said, where it just writes a great article that everyone's going to click on a million times and it's going to attribute a great headline to it. They want attributable it. content. They want a continuous yeah. flow, whether they just report on it or create it themselves. It but doesn't see, matter. The tougher thing is that Neil's answer is defensive. Like, I know I played like shit. I don't want to talk about it. McKinney's answer is kind of giving away insider information. Not not giving away insider information like secrets, but like that shouldn't be keep it in house. That should be in house, right? You know, that's the I do this. You know, I'm sure all you people at work. You know, if you're on a team, a small team, you may fight with your team every single moment you have a team meeting. I don't want to do do it this way. No, do it this way. No, this way. But when it's time for your superiors or another team, you speak with a united voice. All dissension, all discussion, all disagreement is behind closed doors. We say a united answer, and if we don't have an answer, we will get back to you with that. You don't bring dirty laundry out because it undermines everything you do. It undermines all of your credibility. And these guys, you know, I I don't want to hear they're young. They're not that bullshit. We live in a in an age now where these cats from Eighth grade are being groomed to be brands, to interact with the media, to control their narrative. So I don't want to hear from a guy who's been in this league a while saying stupid things like that. That's on you. You weren't baited into it. You need to be better than that. And quite honestly, if he was a captain, I'd strip his ass of captaincy. And I'd really, that really goes into my decision making more than, you know, how's he play on the field is. Do I trust this guy? Do I want to go to war with this guy? Do I want others following this guy into war? So, you know, sometimes character in, in you know, adverse situations, you know, it, it displays character and it puts it out there for all to see and to judge and to evaluate. And we're talking about it. We're not talking about, you know, oh, after school, we're going to play pick up by the lake and, you know, I'll pick these five guys. You pick these. We're talking about a Billion dollar industry with multi million dollar contracts and hundreds and hundreds of jobs on the line based on your performance of what you do. And I can't trust you. And I know what you are. The decision's made very easily. 
and he's making a decision for everyone. So, I guess, I, I don't know. I, I have a theory. You tell me if you think this is silly. I think that a lot of Xavier McKinney's struggles this year, uh, not struggles, but uh, maybe maybe just this quote. Maybe just this quote. Maybe this is attributed to the green dot moving from him to Bobby Okereke. Could be. I mean, so so the reason I say that is because you and I have noticed that Bobby Okereke has obviously been playing very well, especially lately. The tandem of him and Micah McFadden has been very good, especially lately. But especially early on in the year, it was like great plays by Bobby Okereke or he jumped the wrong gap entirely and somebody got right past him. And it was just like, or he just lost contain. He got blocked out of that play or something like that. Um, and that's interesting. I and mean, he's gotten better and, you know, I think I've made the comment before. I don't know if it was on the show or just to you that like I think we paid a guy a year before he's about to break out. Like I think you you said it both both places. I believe. Yeah. I think we've we said it at the games. And I think you've said it on this show. So so I, so I mean I, my my point is, is that like he's still going to make mistakes. We're not buying a guy that was like the number one linebacker on the market. We bought a guy that we thought could be the best linebacker for the system, which, which may fine. mean he's not a hundred percent ready yet. And that's fine. Yeah, I mean, but but. Rather, I, <laughs> Get him at a discount when hoping he gets better. Could you see that theory being sound, though? That McKinney's, totally. McKinney's problem is that he's seeing something. Bobby O'Karake's not. They bring it to Wink Martindale and Wink sides with the linebacker or something like that, you know? Xavier McKinney was a five star recruit in high school. Xavier McKinney played at Alabama, won national titles. Xavier McKinney was a high draft pick with the Giants. Xavier McKinney has had the world handed to him on a silver platter. I would love to know how many times Xavier McKinney had something taken away from him or not go his way. It is human nature when something like this happens, you know, to hold it against someone. I mean, there are episodes of The Sopranos where this happens, where someone's no longer captain. You know, it happens in The Wire. It happens. It happens. It happens in cinema. It happens in literature. It happens in real life. When you are, when you stop going up and you start going down a bit. You re- people react in different ways, and he could be carrying that baggage around with him. And the frustration that he's been carrying probably came out. This is a, you know, a a a, a touch point for the season, and he let it out. Unfortunately, your actions have consequences. I think that this is all I have on this game. I don't want to spend a ton of time. I mean, we are we are entering a world now. You have nothing further to say on this game, right? I, other than thank you to Bobby and Justin for letting us watch together. The point you made earlier was, you know, that's why I love going to games yeah. more than watching on the couch is because if I'm just sitting here by myself, I go freaking mental. I mean, yeah. Watch a Rays game with me and you, you know, I'm, I'm going insane. But when I'm with, you know, I, I have the, the, the honor to sit next to Grump for every game at the Meadowlands. You know, we've been doing this now for 15 years almost. And we know each other. We know, and it, it kind of it, it's a release gasket a little bit. It's like, and Ingrup knows I'm not the most, you know, in my older years, I am not the most, you know, I don't jump up and down like a maniac when something goes bad. Or, and having it with those guys too made it even better because that was one of the honestly one of the five worst days in my 40 years of being a Giant fan for all the situations that happened. Yeah, you know, the, the, on a game level, on a I feel bad for a guy I like level. My, my future is in a compu- complete who knows at this point. That's one of the five worst. We're, we're bordering Mount Rushmore for that. I feel like I'm saying that a lot too often in the last five years, but it's true. So We're not talking about Melissa Stark. That's a special episode when, when it, we talk about uh, – yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm floored that we've been going to games for almost 15 years now. That's yeah. That's pretty wild. Just to think – like. It doesn't seem like that long ago, but it was like 2009, right? 2009. That's crazy. That is yeah. that is wild. We and just it, got married. And we were, yeah, 2009. Um, all right. So <laughs> I, I didn't want to make this too long because at this point we are – we're entering a portion of the season, unfortunately, way, way, way too early. But a portion of the season where we're, we're just talking about the future only. The, the present we, is no longer really uh, – uh, 
topic. Do we, do we even want to do Thursday preview shows anymore this week? Or, I mean, unfortunately, you're I, at the situation. So, so the reason I say yes to that is because they will be just less game centric. It's going to be about development now. I mean, okay. going That's forward, so going forward, we have certain things that I at least I know I want to continue to watch for. Right? Like Evan Neal stinks, but we need to make a decision on him by the end of the year. If we see improvement from him. Go from now until the end of the year, that is certainly something that will make a huge difference in the way right tackles address this offseason. If Justin Pugh shows his, it, it, let's just pretend Evan Neal is hurt or Andrew Thomas has to sit out again and Justin Pugh has, like, do we re sign him as a backup tackle? That's certainly something. John Michael Schmitz has some improving to do. It, you know, his. Evan year Neal one to year two. To do. Oh, absolutely. We're not, Evan, we're not throwing him in the garbage just, just yet. That's what I'm saying. I mean, like, how we address what we deal with Evan Neal in the future happens – all of the information we need happens from now until the end of the season. So it is still important stuff. Deontay Banks is still a young guy that's making mistakes. Trey Hawkins, young guy, making mistakes. Cordell Flott, a young guy, making mistakes. There are plenty of people that we need to make decisions on. And, and quite frankly – there are other things involved. Brian Dable, a young guy making mistakes. Absolutely. To be evaluated. I mean, he's not just because we. He's want not to infallible. Of, we want to. Some people like they're. Everybody on the spectrum is like either fire him right now or he is guaranteed lock coming back next year. And I got to be honest. I don't think it's either. I don't think it's either. I mean, if this team goes to total shit, and Dable starts doing the gaffes that Joe Judge did. Or, you know, as some of his predecessors did, where it's like, this guy can't come back anymore. He may not be back. And it started, the snowball started, may not necessarily have been his fault, but he's really not done much to help himself. So it's very worth monitoring as we go with him. Yeah. So, I mean, we're going to continue to do Thursday shows. They're just going to be structured differently. We're going to, and, and, and quite frankly, the review shows are going to be different. You know, going forward, it's going to be about how players play. It's even if they win the game. I mean, we might be like <laughs> fake excited, yeah. But I mean, we're mostly going to talk about development and how that each week shapes the future just a little bit more. So, stay tuned for the show. You, you know what? And honestly, draft stuff is going to start picking up now. Free agency <laughs> stuff is going to start picking up now. I, I don't mean us. I mean in general, Giants world draft stuff and free agency stuff is going to pick up. I would so, say, if, I would say, if you are a giant fan and you have not been watching college football because you thought up until pretty much this point we're not getting a quarterback i would start watching usc washington michigan michigan uh unc you know, oregon all of these teams a lot of those pack first of all those pack 12 teams are pretty goddamn entertaining it's a thousand points it's scored, fun but. to watch i don't know why people complain but Mm, they're also on late at night, a lot of them too. But yeah, I mean, you should start taking a look because I think a lot of conversation, especially when the season is over and we have, you know, solidified our, our draft pick. That's going to be the focus, I think, for a long time. Not so, just us, but a lot of the content creators that do giant stuff. That And then that's, that's kind of my point is that there's going to be a lot more draft stuff, including on my Grump channel. My football Grump channel will start Ooh. doing some draft stuff coming up this week. I have some stuff already recorded that just needs to be edited, which is a pain in the ass. But Jesus. that will that will come this week. So stay tuned for all of that stuff. And, of course, tell friends about the Just Giants channel as well on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and, of course, YouTube. And we are excited to see you guys Thursday for our preview matchup against the fucking Cowboys. All right, everybody. We will see you Friday morning. Go Giants. Go Giants.